Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Um, it's a great day to be in the house of God, being able to praise Him. Um, if ever we'll stand to our feet for this first song. Rested and my life began. 
When death was arrested and my life began And Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand and everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I would joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength as I feel my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. When everything around me is shaking Oh, I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't, he won't, he won't fail, he won't fail. Christ is my firm foundation 
The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put more faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't He won't fail He won't fail He won't He won't He won't fail He won't Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Well then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing his eminence His name would burst from sea and sky Oh, from the rivers to the mountain tops We'd hear Christ be magnified Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me, and oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. And every creature finds its inmost melody And every human heart its native cry Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise We'll sing Christ, be magnified Christ be magnified in me And oh, Christ be magnified From the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me And I won't bow to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings, I hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway to resurrection life 
If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you in your rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be the same. Christ be magnified, let his praise rise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Christ be magnified in me. Thank you, Isaiah. Is this working? Micah, we really appreciate you guys coming out this morning. Thank you so much. Um, we're going yeah, to, th- yes. It's been great to have them here this morning along with Kevin and see those faces again. Welcome, everybody, to to Edgewood. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? And going to go ahead and release the kids for Children's Church at this time. And and once they've worked their way out, we're going to call the ushers forward for offering. Um, All right, let's, let's bow and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your provision for us, for your love, and uh, and just all, all the things that you give us and 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 bless us with, uh, our friends here and friendships and and how those play into our lives. And Father, I just pray that each and every one here continues to to learn to love you more and love each other better, and continue to look for opportunities to to share your truth in in a dark world around us. Father, we're so blessed to have Stan with us today and and look forward to his message that you've given him to to share with us. Be with us. And and finally, just for for these offerings, Lord, um, for for us that are our members, this is our way of of sharing back with you all your riches and uh, and letting those be turned into blessings for other people. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. So while the offering's going out, we just wanted to do a quick little introduction for Stan. Stan Markowitz is, is an associate pastor at North Shore Baptist, and they just call it North Shore Community now, I think. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm falling back on old habits. Um, but he's the, the small groups pastor there, and uh, came, came out of California, but is now up here in the great Northwest and probably will never leave, Right. But um, we are grateful for Stan, you being willing to come here and, and share with us and, and uh, look forward to having a great time together. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, my name's Stan. Uh, like was just being said, I'm at uh, North Shore Church, which is, uh, it's always been North Shore Church to me, but I've not been there very long. So no, no Baptist uh, in the title for me. Um, but yeah, I'm the small groups pastor. I've been there about two years now. And uh, just a little bit about me so you guys can, you know, kind of know who's talking to you this morning. Uh, so I am i was not on top of things to bring a photo. So that's that's on me. But my family, imagine I have a family. And uh, <laughs> my wife, is, her name is Rosie. And we have a three-year-old named Lee, or he's about to be three. And then we have a, a dog that we got from the shelter who's nuts. And uh, his name is Albie. We've had him for like five years now. And yeah, we're, well, I'm originally from California. I was born and raised Long Beach, California. If there's any Boeing people, maybe you you know Long Beach. But uh, that's where I'm from. My wife is from a small town in Oregon called Klamath Falls, and uh, we met at Biola, which is a Christian college in Southern California that we both went to, and uh, kind of just knew each other in the same circle of, of people, and then 10 years later on Facebook, she just said, hey, what are you up to? And one thing led to another, and now we're married, and we live up here. And so that's kind of uh, us in a, in a nutshell. Uh, North Shore, I, I'm the small groups pastor, like I was saying, and that's kind of my first stint in adult ministries, because Prior to that, for like 15 years, I was a youth pastor. I was in various 
different youth and college ministries uh, around Southern California. A brief stint in Ohio, which is a, a really random story that I don't have to get into or I don't have time to get into this morning. But I, I, the only other place I've lived other than Long Beach is Toledo, Ohio. And I lived there for like 18 months. It was great. Uh, but yeah, basically California my whole life. So when, uh, when I was a youth pastor, what I would like to do to kind of start any, any message is I would, ha- I would give a, a discussion question to the, to the students and then have them discuss with their neighbors and then share their answers. I'm not going to subject you guys to do that, but <laughs> uh, what I am going to do is I'm going to give you a word here in a moment, and I want you just to internally react. So internally react to this word and just notice how you feel about the word. So the word is holiness, holiness. So just think about what your, your internal reaction to that is. What's your, your first reaction to that word? Uh, what images do you associate with that word? Is it a word that you feel like you know or would have a hard time describing what it meant? And then is it a word that has positive or negative connotations for you? And there are no right or wrong answers to this. You know, this is just, we're just kind of getting a baseline for where we're going to go this morning, and we, we probably have a, a variety of reactions going on. There are going to be some people in the room who hear that word and are going to go like, yes and amen, finally a guest speaker is going to talk about what I want to hear about, like they're, they're on board on the holiness topic. And then there's going to be people who are like, I know that's a Christian word, I would have a hard time telling you what it means, I would have a hard time describing what the point of that word is. And then there's going to be people who would associate that word as a negative word because of how it's been used in their history or in other churches or other religious experiences that they've been part of. And so we've got kind of a range of reactions that could happen, and you might find yourself within that range or a completely different reaction. And that's that's totally okay. The the whole reason I'm bringing it up is because within this room, we have a variety of reactions and a variety of feelings about it. And that was the same thing that was happening in Jesus's time too. The word holiness and the concept of holiness is something that people had various feelings on, various beliefs about, various thinkings on, and it is kind of the backdrop to the passage that we're going to look at this morning, this concept of holiness. So if you've got a Bible or if you use your phone, I'm not going to be offended if you use your phone or whatever, or if you just want to listen along, that's totally okay too. We're going to be in Luke 5, verses 27 through 32. We're just going to look at one small section, Luke 5, verses 27 through 32. We're going to look at one small section. We're actually only going to look at like half of this story. This story keeps going and you can read on it on your own. Uh, but this is, this is my favorite passage in all of the Bible. I think it uh, has done a lot in my own life personally, but I also think it has shaped how I think about ministry and just how I think about the church and a lot of different things. And I just think there's a lot to it, and we're just going to be able to look at one kind of narrow slice of it. But it's a, it's a really rich passage. So uh, before we read it, we are going to need some background that will help us understand it once we start reading it. And the unfortunate side of this is that the background comes from Leviticus. And so, you know, if you ever tried to do a Bible reading plan, that's the book that you got to and was like, oh, maybe I'll skim this one. You know, just like, I, I, this one I don't get. Um, so we're just going to need some, some concepts from it. Um, so Leviticus is, is God's law to his chosen people, the Israelites, and there's a lot going on in it. But the whole point of it is how does Israel maintain their relationship with God? How do they stay in relationship with God? And one part of the law was that they had this purity code system. And there are four statuses within the purity code. You have uh, profane, unclean, clean, and holy. I probably should have done that the other direction for your sake. But profane is the bad one, and holy is the good one. And then in the middle is the unclean and the clean one. And uh, basically, these are statuses about approaching God. And so the middle ones, clean and unclean, was when you were clean, you were able to go into God's presence, and you were able to participate in community. So you could go to the synagogue, you could offer sacrifices, you could go into the marketplace if you were clean, and if you were unclean, you couldn't do those things. You had to go through a ritual washing before you were allowed to go back into the synagogue or go back into the temple or to offer a sacrifice. And the way you became unclean from clean, which is the kind of a neutral, uh, I'm able to go approach God, Uh, is there are just various things. If you had uh, touched something dead, like a piece of meat, that would make you unclean. If you uh, sometimes ate the wrong thing, that would make you unclean. If you had a certain type of sickness, that would make you unclean, which if you were here during the pandemic, if you were alive during the pandemic, which you all were, you know, we all can relate to that one, right? (laughs) Like I was in Costco the other day and someone sneezed and it was like, are they allowed to be here? Like, (laughs) should someone do something about this? Because it was just like a really weird experience. But that is kind of the, the experience of being clean and unclean, uh, and 
Clean and unclean are not moral categories. They're just kind of facts of life. People kind of oscillated between them and just various things would happen in their life. And you just had to, before you could go into God's presence, make sure that you were clean. And the one other thing about being unclean is that it uh, is kind of like zombie rules. Like, you know, one by zombie bites someone, they now become a zombie. If something was unclean and it touched something else, now that thing was unclean. So you had to, you know, make sure that if something became unclean, it got ritually washed and made clean quickly. So those are just, that's kind of the middle categories. And then at the ends of the spectrum, you have profane and holy. And so profane was a step beyond unclean. Profane is when things start to become rejections of God. Profane is when things start to become, uh, you are a, uh, an antagonist towards God. So Israel's idolatry and Israel's oppression of the poor were called profane, profane, or it was sometimes called defiling. They were rejections of what God wanted to them. Holiness, or holy, was the category when something was specifically dedicated to God. So if you go into the temple, as you move deeper and deeper into the temple, the places became holier and holier until you got to the most innermost part where um, God's presence was most central and most accessible, and that was the holiest of holies. And so the things that were, you know, the different instruments used for sacrifices, those were called holy objects because they stayed within the temple. They stayed within God's space. They weren't supposed to leave that space. So that's kind of the, the system. An individual kind of lived somewhere on that, uh, that, that spectrum. And for the most part, most individuals lived in the clean or unclean category and just kind of operated between the two of them. The priests were supposed to be holy, that sort of thing. But the nation of Israel as a whole lived on the spectrum as well. And they were judged as a collective as well as to whether they were clean, unclean, holy, or profane. And the thing about it is that the land was going to be the barometer of how they were doing. It was going to let them know how they were doing, whether they were following God's law, whether they were a holy nation or not. And that they were, um, basically, if the land was blessing them, and the land was providing for them, that was the indicator that they were following after God. And if they were having difficulty as a nation, if the land was, there was a famine, if there were um, just different things, that, natural disasters that would happen, that would let them know, oh, we have gone and defiled God's land. We're living in a profane way. And so that's kind of the, the thing you just need to know. And I know that you're thinking, full PSA on Leviticus, is it too late for a different guest speaker? And yes, it is. We're already here. We're almost to Jesus, so just stick with me. So, the, the whole point of this is just to say, when you get to Jesus' time, they are, the Israelites are in the land, but they are controlled by Rome. There is a Roman captivity that's going on. And so everyone's looking at that and going, well, we're back in the land. And they were told, if, if the land vomits you out, if someone takes you into exile, you've really gone too far into the profane category. And it, the fact that they're in the land says that they've done something right, but the fact that they don't control the land lets them know something is still wrong. And everyone is trying to figure out what's wrong, and everyone's answer is that there's a holiness issue. There is an issue within the community. People are not being holy enough, and people are trying to figure out what's the best way to be holy. And They're trying to figure out what's the way that God wants us to live. And there are all these different groups that have competing visions of what holiness looks like and have competing visions of who are God's chosen people. And what we're about to read is Jesus interacting with one of those competing visions and offering a different way. So now we can look at Jesus. Thank you for sticking with me in the Leviticus stuff. We're now in Luke 5, verse 27 through 32. We'll kind of just take it verse by verse. Um, so it first says after this in verse 27, and the, the after this is this moment where Jesus uh, gave his first public sermon. And he says, this is the year of the Lord's favor. He is delivering sight to the blind. He's referencing this, uh, this prophecy out of Isaiah of what life is going to be like with the Messiah and that uh, he's uh, helping the afflicted, bringing sight to the blind, helping the lame walk. And then what, you know, he gives that sermon and then everything else that Luke shows us is Jesus gathering disciples and people experiencing that year of the Lord's favor. Blind are given sight, crippled are able to walk, things like that. And so this is kind of still within this framework where Luke is saying, Jesus showed up on the scene, said he was going to do this, and this is the version of that taking place in people's real world. So uh, he's been collecting some disciples, and then says this in verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And, he, and follow me, he said to him. And he got up and followed him, leaving everything behind. So just kind of the, the brief interaction there is you've got this guy Levi, uh, and Jesus invites him 
to be a disciple. And there's just a few things you need to know about this interaction. So these guys exist in an honor-shame culture. And in an honor-shame culture, different professions are ranked on, or everything is kind of ranked on a spectrum of honorable to dishonorable. And there are different professions that are more honorable than others. And Jesus, his profession is being a rabbi. And so that is the most honorable position that anybody could have in that society. And the second most honorable uh, position was to be a disciple of a rabbi, because that meant you were on the trajectory towards being a rabbi. And the way this kind of system worked is that uh, all the Jewish kids would go to, to you know, their Hebrew school, and they would learn the first five books of the Bible. And then the promising ones would get told, you need to learn the rest of the Old Testament. And if you did that and you did well at that, you would then go seek out a rabbi, and if the rabbi would test you to see if you really knew your stuff, then he would invite you to be a disciple. And the, ex the exceptional ones were only the ones that were allowed. Everybody else kind of went back into their, their parents' professions. They went back into, you know, if your dad was a, a stonemason, you would become a stonemason. If your dad was a butcher, you would become a butcher, that sort of thing. So the nature of Levi being a tax collector tells you that Levi was not an exceptional person. You know, or he was not exceptional in knowing the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament for us. He has already been filtered out at some other way. But the other thing about it is that uh, Levi is a tax collector, and that is the most dishonorable profession that you could have. So um, Jesus being the most honorable profession. So I, I'm a, a child of immigrants. My dad is a, he's Polish and English, and he grew up all around Europe. My mom is Indian, but she's from Fiji. That's how you get a person who looks like me with the last name Markowski. I'm very self-aware about that <laughs> unusual dynamic there. Um, <laughs> but when you grow up in an immigrant household, you know, there are professions to aspire to. There is doctor, lawyer, engineer, and everything else is letting everybody else down. <laughs> and the worst thing you can do is follow your dreams. And so Jesus has achieved the doctor, lawyer, engineer of his day. And Levi has done the worst thing imaginable. He has become a tax collector. He has done the thing that no Jewish kid should ever do. Because beyond just being a profession that um, was not, an, uh, not just like being a butcher or whatever, it was actually seen as being a traitor to the nation. It was seen as being a person who betrayed Israel. Because the way the system worked is that, you know, you know Rome would set up a road. and They'd set up a tax collecting booth, and if you use that road, you had to pay on that. And Rome would say, hey, everyone that comes through, get a dollar from them. They didn't use dollars, but, you know, it's just simple for us. So get a dollar from them. But if you want a little bit for yourself, feel free to get something for yourself as well. And we'll give you guards to make sure that you get paid. And so they were not only just collecting taxes for Rome. They were often stealing from their fellow countrymen. And they were seen as enabling the oppression that Rome was bringing. And, you know, to kind of state the emotional uh, weight of this, this would be the equivalent of during World War II, a, during Nazi Germany, a Jewish person helping the Nazis catch other Jewish people. That's like the level of bad that would be going on here. And in religious terms, the, the Pharisees, who we'll, we'll get to here in a second, they said tax collectors were perpetually unclean, and they were beyond repentance, that they had no hope of ever entering God's presence ever again. And they would say, if a tax collector ever entered your home, they would make everything in your house unclean. So no one would associate with these people. And so what's happened here is, Jesus has now invited this person who is the worst of the worst, you know, the, the person that no one wants to associate with, the person who's been filtered out religiously, and invited them into being his disciple and said, you are actually exceptional. You are actually worthy of being my disciple. You are actually worthy of following me. And he's taken someone who was completely dishonorable and made them honorable, made them the second highest in their society, and he's invited them in. So let's keep going. Verse 29. Then Levi gave a great banquet in his house for Jesus. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. So Jesus shows Levi a great honor. Levi does the thing that makes sense in his society to reciprocate back. And he shows Jesus a great banquet. And it says that uh, there was others and tax collectors. And if you watch Lost, you know how spooky the others are. But the... the <laughs> This is a dated reference, but thank you for laughing at that one. Um, <laughs> Levi has no reputable people who will associate with him. So who he's invited, the others, is this category of prostitutes and thieves, other people who were considered outside the bounds of being religious and being holy and being good people. Thieves, you know, people like that. And these are the only people who will come eat at Levi's house because that's the only people who he's been able to associate with for however long he's been a tax collector. 
And Jesus goes to this party. And kind of what you need to picture is that um, Levi probably has the largest house in the community, and there would be like a courtyard area, and that's where the party would be taking place. And outside the walls of the house or outside the courtyard, people would be standing around gathered. Because in this society, you would not eat meat very often. You would not kill an animal very often because, you know, you didn't have refrigeration and you didn't have these ways of preserving it. So when you would kill something, you often would have way more than you could eat for your own family and you would need to give it away. So there are people who would not associate with Levi on a daily basis, but they would still be outside his house gathered hoping that, oh, maybe we'll get some of the scraps or maybe there'll be leftovers and, and that sort of thing. So verse 30, it says, but the Pharisees and the experts of the law complained to the disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So the Pharisees show up and they're outside. They would definitely not be in uh, Jesus uh, in this party. They would not be in the courtyard. And they're speaking to the disciples because probably what's going on is that in this courtyard, you know, if Levi and all his friends are like toxic waste <laughs> taking place in this party, uh, they're going to be at the outskirts by the windows. They don't want to get close to them. They don't probably really want to associate with them. And if you, you know, imagine it's a, uh, you've basically got Jesus, a brand new Christian, and then all the friends from, you know, the den of iniquity. <laughs> you know, what kind of things are going on in this party? You can infer from there, right? Like, that's probably not uh, where most uh, good religious people would want to be. And so these guys are on the outside, and they're complaining to the disciples. And their complaint is interesting from our perspective, because they say, why is he eating and drinking with them? Why is he having a meal with them? And what they're referencing is that... Um, in the prophets, in the Old Testament prophets, when there was a prophecy about uh, the Messiah showing up, they would say that uh, it would be often described as this great meal, this banquet that would be taking place. And they would say that, uh, so they had invented this idea called table fellowship. And table fellowship is this idea that when you eat with someone, you are reenacting the messianic banquet that's supposed to happen at the end when the Messiah comes back and redeems everything. So if the Messiah is going to have this table filled with all these people who love God, when you eat with people, your table should be filled with people who love God. And so when you ate with someone, you were endorsing their way of life. You were saying, I think you and I will be at the Messianic banquet together. So when they see Jesus eating with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the thieves and all the people you shouldn't be around, what they see him saying is, those are the people who are going to be at the Messiah's table. And they're upset at that. And they think, this is not... This is not what it's supposed to look like. Because the Pharisees' vision of this would be, my table is going to be filled with other Pharisees. And the way we're going to get other Pharisees is by separating away from the people who don't deserve to be at the table. And they're going to ostracize people. And they're going to shame people. And they're going to push people away. And that's their hope of forcing people into repentance. That's their hope of their way of saying, hey, if we make people feel bad about their own lifestyle, that will bring them back in. That's, that's their strategy here. And the only people that they saw at the table with them is other people like them. And so Jesus, eating with these people, communicates that he endorses these people. He accepts these people. He is with these people. So verse 31 and 32, it says this. Jesus answered them, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus hears their complaint, and he says, you're right. There is something wrong here. There is something that's not supposed to be happening here. But it's not good people over here and evil people in here. It's sick and healthy people. And these people are sick. And I'm coming as a doctor to them. And I'm bringing healing uh, in my presence, in my restoration. Or I'm bringing, through my presence, healing and restoration to them. I'm making them well. And they're not making me sick. We're actually getting better by me being here with them. See, what Jesus is doing, Jesus and the Pharisees actually want similar things. They want people to change. They want people to repent. They want people to return back to God. But they just have very different ways of getting there. The Pharisees are separating away from people and making people feel bad about them, about the choices they've made and experiencing shame and all that kind of stuff. And Jesus is going, I'm going to go to them. I'm going to go be with them. I'm going to surround myself with them. And they're not going to, you know, their uncleanness, their pro profaneness, their defilement, it's not going to make me those things. In fact, what you're going to see happen is those people are going to be made holy. The holiness is going to be contagious, not the uncleanness, which would be the expectation for people. And Jesus has this vision that change happens through his association with people. And this is kind of a, a nuance that we didn't get into in the very beginning, but when we're talking about holiness, there's kind of two main categories. There's the holiness that is about being fit for God's presence, the ability to come into God's presence or to be something that's dedicated to God, 
But when you talk about God's presence or God's holiness uh, within himself, it's, it's a characteristic at that point. It's an attribute at that point. And the holiness that has to do with clean and unclean and holiness and profanity and all that kind of stuff is more about us going, we should take our sin seriously. We can't just frivolously approach God. That was the point of it in the Old Testament. A little different now, but just that was the point in the, in the Old Testament. God's holiness, the holiness that he possesses within himself, actually demonstrates that God draws near to people who are sinful. God comes after people who are sinful. God, and not in a, like, I'm going to get you sort of way, but in a, like, I, I want to heal you. I want you to experience something better. I want you to be uh, whole again. And there are just these portraits of God who seeks after people who are struggling with sin. So in Levi's case, Jesus invited him to leave his tax collecting and come follow him. And in that, Levi is going to experience restoration. He is going to become a new person. He's been following Jesus for a half hour at this point. He's only at the very beginning. But he's going to be a completely changed person by the end of this because he's going to be following Jesus now. And that's the picture. Jesus is demonstrating it's not anyone's sin that's contagious in a way that make God, would make God run away from them. It's God's holiness compels people to want to follow him. And when people start following him, they can't help but change. When you're close to God, you can't stay the same. And God doesn't leave you the way that he found you, but he will accept you the way that he found you. He is willing to take you as you are, but you won't stay that way because you'll just be so compelled by knowing him. Later on in, uh, in Luke, the Pharisees, again, will be uh, upset at Jesus' association with people who are the bad people. And Jesus says to them, you guys, you want to know what repentance is like? It's like a man who has 100 sheep, and one of them goes astray. And he, go, he leaves the 99 behind and goes and seeks that one and brings them back. He says, you want to know what repentance is like? It's like a woman who has 10 coins, and she loses one. And she sweeps the house, and she finds her coin, and then she brings it back to the purse, and she gets all her neighbors, and they celebrate. And the, the man who found his sheep, they celebrate. And he says, you want to know what repentance is like? It is like a father who has two sons. And one of the sons comes to him and says, the younger son comes to him and says, I wish you were dead so I could have my, my inheritance and go live the way that I wanted. You're, you're holding me back. And if you're uh, you know, in this first century time period, this feels like a setup for like a German fairy tale. <laughs> it's like, you know, be good at Christmas and Santa will bring you presents or a demon will eat you if you're bad. Because you know? <laughs> you what would happen is that uh, fathers had the right to execute their children for disrespect in the first century. And the parents of the teenagers are like, yeah, amen, let's bring that one back. But... Uh, <laughs> The setup is you would think that the father would go, absolutely not, let's, let's beat this kid or whatever. But he says, okay, I'm going to give you your inheritance. Go, go do what you want with it. And the son goes off and he wastes it and he falls into slavery and all these different things, bad things happen to him. And he decides, I need to go home. I, I'm, I need to return back to my dad and make amends and hopefully I need to beg that he would take me back. And it says that the son started approaching the house on the horizon and the father sees him and runs to him. And goes and he doesn't make him crawl back. He actually runs to him and meets him at the distance. And he gives him new clothes and he puts a ring on his finger and he, he, he says, let's, let's throw a banquet. We need to celebrate the fact that you're back. And he accepts him back as a full son, not as a hired hand. And the other son, who was the good kid, who didn't do anything wrong, hears all this and is upset. And he won't go to the party because he's like, dad, this kid just wasted everything. And I've been here working for you the whole time and I didn't get anything out of it. And so you think, oh, this is the twist. This is Jesus saying, ah, and so then we executed that kid instead. But Jesus actually goes and says, no, the father goes out of the party and invites that son in too. Because as much as Jesus has tension with the Pharisees over the course of the book, that, that older son represents them. And he's saying, hey, God wants you in the party as well. You know, you're struggling with your uh, kind of shame-based religion. God has something else for you too. God has some other way of healing you as well. And you, you see that this portrait that Jesus has of repentance and this portrait of how God interacts with people is God does want life change to happen. God does want people to leave their sin behind and be made whole and to be holy people. But there is a seeking out that God does to go after people and to bring them back. And when people make mistakes, God's like, no, nope, you get one and that's it. Like, sorry, you're out of luck now. No, God, has, he runs to the people. Hey, there's a, there's a hint of that person wanting to come back. Let me let me bring them back into the fold. Let me share, let me show them that they are welcome back at any time. There's one other story that, uh, that Jesus shares, or not Jesus shares, Jesus experiences, where, uh, this is in the Gospel of John, there's a woman and she's, she's drawing water uh, in the heat of the day and there's no one else around and Jesus is sitting there with her and it's a very unusual circumstance. And 
uh, Jesus invites her to give him a glass of water, and they start talking. And at one point, Jesus says to her, um, go, go tell your husband to come talk to me. You know, why don't you? And she's, she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right, you don't have a husband. And you have had five husbands, actually. And we hear that dynamic, and we think that what Jesus is saying is, or, you know, kind of implied is this is this promiscuous woman. She's had multiple husbands, all, you know, who knows what's happened in her life. But when you know the first kind of century context, what's actually going on here is, you know, women did not have any legal right to work. They had to get provision through their husbands. And if you didn't have a husband, you were destined to beg. And so this woman has the choice of get married, be with all these different men, uh, or beg. And women also had no right to divorce. You know, they were at the, the, you know, the will of their husbands. And Jesus even says to her, even the person you're with now is not your husband. And what Jesus is naming in this woman's life is that not that she's some promiscuous woman who needs to get it, you know, clean herself up and get it back together. He's actually seeing how she's been a victim over her life and the ways that she's been taken advantage of by different men over the years. And she tells, and they keep interacting, and she's like, I gotta go tell my village about you. And she goes back to the village and she says to this village, come meet a man who, who told me everything I'd ever done. And I think what she's saying there is she's saying, come meet this man who saw what was going on in my life for the first time. And Jesus goes to that village and they all wanna become followers of him as well. And what you see what happens there is this woman has not only been restored in her own life, the, the shame that she's been carrying is starting to be healed, but now she's being restored back to her village as well. There's a, uh, a communal restoration that happens when we start to follow God. There's no sin or shame or situation that God is scared of, that Jesus is staying away from. And the invitation to us is to actually have those things and bring them into God, that when we bring those things into God's presence, we find healing, we find wholeness, as well. And I want to just say one really practical thing about that that just needs to be named for us to do this well, is sometimes these things are instantaneous, and sometimes these things are a process. When you see Levi at the tax collecting booth, instantaneous change, right? Like things change immediately for him. He was a tax collector, now he's not. Woman at the well, again, instantaneous change. Things happen rapidly. But there are people who it's a long process for, and that's something we have to be open to as well. And I think Peter is the, is the model of that. So uh, one of the early distinctives of the church after Jesus resurrects and ascends to heaven is that they were known as this place where different ethnic identities were reconciled to one another, that Jewish people and Gentile people would actually share space together and be in relationship together. And they called them Christians because they didn't know what else to call this unified people group. But Peter really struggles with this. Peter has a hard time with this. And uh, Peter, in his life, gets three years of walking around with Jesus, and then he gets to see the sign of tongues that happens in the beginning of Acts, and then he gets a specific vision from God about accepting the Gentiles, and then he does ministry for like 15 to 20 years. It's kind of ambiguous when it's taking place, but then he goes to do ministry in uh, Galatia, and he withdraws from the Gentile believers and only eats with the Jewish ones, and Paul has to go confront him and go, you know, this is not what it's supposed to look like. We're supposed to be reconciled with these people, and it, in Galatians, Paul says, I have to confront him. But, you know, again, he's inviting him in. And I think it's just a good reminder that, you know, you can be walking with Jesus for a long time and still need to process a lot of things. And some things can take a long time. Because sometimes you're headed in one way for 20 years. And if you just think about that, you might have to head back the other direction for 20 years just to get to neutral. And God is with you in that journey as well. That's just part of the process with God. And the last thing I just kind of want to share about it is that on a practical level, this just gives us a lot of insights into how to think about how to evangelize and how to operate in the world. You know, when you just reflect on this story, you see how Jesus is interacting with Levi and the tax collectors and just kind of his overall perspective of repentance is Jesus is very willing to go to those places that most religious people would stay away from. And he's willing to just be a presence there and not be shook by it, but just be a healing presence there. And we have to learn to be able to do the same. If we're going to be, you know, the version of Jesus that most people get to meet. And I don't mean that like we're becoming God, but just in the sense of like we represent God. You know, as Christians, we represent what Jesus is like to a community. And so we have to think about how do we carry that same attitude into places that we go. And if you, uh, I, I went to seminary and then I went to a second seminary, so I've spent a lot of money on seminary. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that you like start to think about in seminary is how should a church operate? Like what's kind of the 
kind of functional things and you know, kind of one of the shorthand things that people say is that every church has to think about um, how, how it will be a community around believing, behaving, and belonging. Believing, behaving, and belonging. You've got to kind of get those three things. And you have to order them in some way. And a lot of places will order it around belief and behave first, and then you can belong. Believe and behave first, and then you can belong. And there's kind of this withholding of, we will not accept you until you clean yourself up enough, and you believe the right things, and you think the right things. And there's a pastor that I really like out of New York, John Tyson, and when he reflected on kind of those three categories in Jesus' ministry, he said, you know, what I notice about Jesus is that Jesus kind of ordered it, belong, believe, behave. That Jesus was willing to offer unconditional grace and mercy and hospitality and acceptance to people first. Because he was confident that once they got close to him, they'll believe and they'll behave. Things will start to fall in order in their life. And it may take a long time. And Jesus was just willing to release that timing. He was willing to be okay. Because a lot of these people that you see walking around with Jesus over the three years, you can tell. I mean, even the disciples, none of them were at the cross with him for the most part. But after the resurrection, they were all willing to give their lives. They were all willing to go the distance with him. It just took a while to get to that point. And so we often think that we have to be these people who kind of hold the line on certain things. And instead, we need to be these kind of people who represent there is a God out there who is willing to enter into your situation and be with you and be in that situation, and you will find healing there. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg for this passage. I would just encourage you guys to keep meditating on it. There's a whole second half of the story that we didn't get to get into. But if I could just encourage you with one thing, is that no matter what you've got going on in your life, God wants to be in it with you, and he can bring healing into that circumstance. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship a little more. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the model we see of you in the world, and we just pray that um, whatever situations are going on in this room, whatever circumstances or long personal things that we've been dealing with, Lord, you would just be meeting us in those, and that we would find healing and restoration in knowing you, and that we would also be encouraged and filled to go back into the world and bring the same to others so that they would know you as well. In your name, amen. You can go ahead and stand to your feet. This next song that we are doing today is a new one that we haven't done here before. It's called Abide. <clears throat> the chorus goes, Lord, all I want is all you are. You're the one that I delight in. Forever I'll abide in you. And that that's, should be our prayer, that we can delight in what God delights in, and that we can delight in him, and that we can be fully satisfied having all that God is and abiding in him. To finish what you saw 
And Lord, all I want is all you are. You're the one that I delight in forever. I'll abide in you. And all I want is all you are. You're the one. Micah, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, just as a closing, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Stan. Belong, believe, and behave. Um, it's something for all of us to be thinking about. You know, how can we do that with our own families, with this family? We love you all. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thanks for being here today. Thank you for Stan's message. Thank you for loving us and providing for us. Be with us this week. In your name, amen.